two to the 30th centuries, we will sooner or later discover the truth of who wins when they move first. Right? If we sooner or later play all the games, we'll know how to play perfectly. That's what we're doing here, but we're actually playing all the games, and we see who wins. And this time, you won. The universals win, and when the universals win, that means the formula cannot be satisfied. When the existentials win, that means the formula can be satisfied. Everybody get a sense of this? Okay. Right, you know what? I wanna, I'm definitely going to finish this today, but I'm not going to do Savage's theorem today. I'm going to do this a different day when you're clean and clear, and I don't have to keep you late. So let's finish this one idea today, because this is going to be nice, and I'll leave Savage's for a different day. Tomorrow, maybe. Are you going to do the recursion theorem? I wasn't going to, but I will if you want. That's so cool. Neil wants me to do the recursion theorem. That's a theorem that says that a machine can basically look at itself and spit its own description out on its tape. This is like a, a fun puzzle you give to beginning students. Anytime they learn a programming language, you say, write me a program that actually prints itself out. So here, print, print. Does that work? Almost. This program, when you run it, just does this. And I want it to do print, print. So at first you think about it for a while and you go, there's no way to do it. But you need just a little bit of a breakthrough and you figure out a way to write a program that can print itself out. And that's exactly the trick in the recursion theorem. It's the same trick. If you can figure out how to do this for a programming language, you can figure out why the recursion theorem works. But I'm completely off on a <laughs> side thing, and I'm not going to do this right now. Uh, you know what, maybe I'll run, do it as a recitation, or I'll do it as an optional thing. Um, just as, as a side point, I'm trying to finish this class on Friday, and I definitely will get to and beyond what I think is a reasonable amount for one semester. Nevertheless, as you probably can guess, there's a hundred other things you can do in this class. You can go on for another course, and then a graduate course, and a few more. So if there's people who are in excuse me, interested in things like this or other things, I'll be happy to run like little small recitations next week when we're doing that Unix workshop week, you know, just as, as you know, interesting things. Because there's a few things that we definitely won't have time to do that are still fun. And I'll do that stuff. But now we're getting back to this. Yeah, it is really cool. You're right, Neil. It is really cool. <laughs> That's all right. I like getting interrupted because I get to talk more. I get to... All right. <laughs> uh, where were we? Quantified Boolean formula. Let's try to decide how we'd solve this. You're going to write a program to do this. How would you do it? How do you write a program to solve this? I want to get a sense of where this sits. I mean, I told you it's out here in polynomial space, but how do you know that? How come it's not polynomial time? How come it's not non-deterministic polynomial time? After we figure out where this is, we're going to convert this into a completely different form to show that a very different problem is p-space complete. But before we do that reduction, let's just analyze this problem and see how long it takes to solve it. How would you solve this problem? What is there to do? Is this satisfiable? And then at the next level up, you would do a satisfiable problem. Is this unsatisfiable? Yeah, what you're saying is right, but I wouldn't call it min-max, I'd call it and-or. We're going to actually write it out. We have two choices for x1, true or false. If either one of them work, then I win. And once I choose one of them, I have two choices for you. They both have to work for me to win. Then, I'm back to the or level. I get to choose. If one of the two works, I win. Now I'm at the bottom of my tree. What do these represent? They represent actual formulas that I can plug values in. This is a choice of true, false, true, false, true, false. This is x1, this is x2, this is x3. Right? So when I get down to the bottom here, say to this one, this represents x1 is false, x2 is false, and x3 is true. And we check it. We check that formula. We check this formula. If these are both one or the other, sorry, if one or the other of these is true, then I mark this as true. I work my way back up this tree. An or gets marked true 
if one or more of its children is true. And and gets marked true only if both of its children are true. And if this reminds you of alternation a little bit, it should. That's why I mentioned it. And when you get to here, if this or this ends up being true, then you mark this true. If the thing up here gets marked true, you answer yes, there's an assignment. And if the thing up here gets marked false, you answer no, there's no assignment. Now, how long does it take to do this? How big is this tree? There's only three variables here, and we generated a tree with eight leaves. If there were n variables, we would have generated a tree with 2 to the n leaves. We do an assignment calculation on each one of these. So that takes, whatever, uh, three steps for each one to calculate a true or false. And then we've got to take it and run it back through, doing ors at each node or ands at each node. So that's going to do a number of steps equal to all the internal nodes. That's going to double this. There's as many nodes here as there are nodes here. So 2 to the n plus 1 time to go ahead to do this. Exponential time to solve this problem. Way out here. Can we do it in p-space? Could we do it in non-deterministic polynomial time? We could do regular 3-set in exponential time, but when we try it with non-determinism, we get it to polynomial time. How do we do that? We just guess true and false values. We do that in three steps, and then we check it in linear time. How come I can't do that now? Three satisfiability gives me the same tree, the same exact tree. True or false for x1, true or false for x2, true or false for x3. The same computations at the bottom. If this was regular satisfiability, everything's exactly the same except for one thing. What's different about QBF compared to regular satisfiability? It's not enough information. Right, but more spe you're right, but more specifically and, and more obviously at the top level. If I do this for 3 sat, I got the same tree, the same exact thing, eight things in the bottom. And if one of these turns out to be true, then I say true. What's that mean? That means each of these nodes on the top are what kind of nodes? They're OR nodes. And if they're OR nodes, I just have to guess a sequence through, and I get it for free with non-determinism. The problem here is that I got these AND nodes at different levels. So here's what an accepting computation looks like. It's not a line anymore. It's, it ends up being this kind of a subtree. And I don't get this for free in parallel. I don't get ANDs for free in parallel in non-determinism. I actually have to go down both and check it. So because of that, maybe I cut it down halfway, because half the different nodes I can take advantage of them, but the other half I can't. So maybe I get you know, 2 to the n divided by 2. But it's still exponential. So I can't do this in non-deterministic polynomial time. I can't do it in non-deterministic polynomial time, or at least I don't see any way to do it, because the ands have to be traversed themselves. You don't get those in parallel. If it was an alternating machine, you could do it. But you don't have an alternating machine. But how do you do it in a polynomial space? Same as trick as we did before. Don't go ahead and store the whole tree, which gives you this exponential stuff. Just go down a single path and work your way back up, remembering that this is an OR node, just, just like you did with a depth first search, if you did the go uh, problem in algorithms. When you come back to a spot, you've got to determine if you're going to take those pieces off. So remember, whether all the other paths out of there were surrounded. You remember that this is an OR node and that this is an AND node. And you just go ahead, depth first search, and you back up, and you go ahead and see if one or more of the things that are coming back ended up being true. And here, if all of them coming back end up being true. You can traverse through this tree space-wise, keeping only one thread through the whole tree. Right. If you get that fine, and if you don't, we'll go back on it again. Because understanding why things are in p-space takes some practice. But that is supposed to convince you that QBF is in p-space. That we can go through this tree by keeping only one thread through the tree at any time, backing our way up and down recursively. All right. I don't want to spend too much more time on it, because the reduction itself is more interesting and easier to understand. So that convinces us that this problem is in p-space. Now I'm going to show you that there's another problem that is p-space complete because this problem reduces to it. And I'm going to do a reduction example directly from this example.